Good morning. See if I figured this out correctly. There we go. I'd like to talk this morning about God's saving grace. Last time I spoke about the grace part, and today I want to talk about works. This is an excellent text. I keep a separate little printout copy of it in my Bible to remind me of this, the words of this text. So today we're talking about what is works. Quick review of last time. Last time I was up here, we talked about grace. We said that grace is the uh, Greek word charis. Greek word charis. It's interpreted primarily in four different ways. We said it's a favor, kindness, or friendship. We cited Genesis 6, 8, saying that, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God's forgiving mercy is another definition that's commonly used. We looked at Ephesians 2, 5. Even when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ by grace you are saved. Thirdly, the gospel, as distinguished from the law, is often spoken of as grace, mainly from John 1, 17, for it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And also, and probably most well known, is as a gift. John 1, 16, For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And so many uh, other texts that talk about uh, Kadis as a gift. So let's uh, go to the next screen. Here's the probably Ephesians 2, 1 through 9 is probably the best known text that talks about uh, grace and it is cited by so many people. Let me uh, better yet find it here and I'll read it from here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 the Bible says, I'm at the age where I either put them on or take them off. <laughs> right now I've got to take them off. Ephesians 2, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. And so in the ages to come we might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And it was about 8 o'clock I realized I'm mix, missing verse 8. <laughs> For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no man can boast. And probably the second also famous verse that talks about grace is this one, John 1, 17, and we saw it earlier. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What are works? The Greek word that is... The root of all this is ergon. And some of the definitions is common labor in employment that renders a wage. Secondly, a deed or act that is done. Thirdly, any product or thing accomplished by hand, art, industry, or mind. So you're producing something, but primarily in employment with the expectance of a wage. Something you gain. Romans 4.4, 4. now to him that works, and here's ergosamai, ergazomai, and this word is coming from this one. So to him that works, the recompense is not counted as a gift, as kadis, but of debt. Means, I owe it to you. If I tell you, mow my lawn, I'll give you 25 bucks, 
and you mow my lawn and I can say this is a gift and it's the 25 bucks, you'll say, uh-uh. Or if I say, you know what, I'm not going to pay you. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to thank you very much. You're going to say, no, you owe me. So the idea of working means you're earning a wage. Here's some more verses that talk about this. Ephesians 2.9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, the idea that if I did it, uh, I can boast about my accomplishment. Blessed is that slave whom the master finds at work when he comes. Here's another verse that talks about work. And we see that it's, it's a good sense because the master comes home and what does he find his slave doing? He's working. He's doing what's expected of him. Romans 6.23, not one's favorite verse for many people. For the wages, or ergon, of sin is death. So that's another uh, Bible verse that uses this word and translates it as wages. So ergon is work as an employment and gain of wages. Let's continue. I like this verse. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Who disagrees with that? The farmer sows, he cultivates, he waters, and then he finally reaps the crop. He has a right to the crops. It's his way. He, they're his crops, and he has a right to share of those crops. This one I found interesting. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while it is threshing. God even is, is considering the ox. Why? Because he's working. He's actually turning that millstone, and usually those were uh, made of uh, a heavy rock to turn that uh, wheat into flour. And so he said, and in this case, this is simply separating the seed from the, uh, from the sticks themselves. So do not uh, muzzle the ox while it is threshing. And also the laborer is worthy of his wages. So therefore, work in itself is not sinful, where it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Work in itself is not sinful. It's what we make of ourselves because of work that could be sinful. And that's what we're, the next thing. So why does the Bible condemn works? Or the better question is, what kind of works does it condemn? Because there are good works and there are bad works. So we've seen this one. This is verse 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then this one, which is not the favorite verse of many, for the wages or the work, the end, the end result of our work of sin is death. So what are wages? It's what you earn. And I've said it before, for this Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, common saying, you made your bed, now what? Now sleep in it. That's what this is talking about. We sinned, and now we have to reap the benefits of sin, of what we have done. Okay, continue. What kind of works does the Bible condemn? One, works that a man boasts about, thereby demanding uh, payment and a recognition of his accomplishments. Okay, so those are what are works that uh, the Lord condemns. Okay, and then we can see Ephesians 2.9, many times we've already seen it, not a work lest any man should boast. And I want you to recall the opening verses of this lesson. Let's read them. It says, And which of you, having a servant, uh, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. He says, hey, come on in, let's have something to eat. No, that's not what you, what you do, he says in verse 8. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something uh, for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk. And afterwards you will eat and drink. Isn't that rather what he says? Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I think not, says the Lord Jesus speaking. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you were 
uh, commanded, we should say, we are unprofitable servants. One version says, we are unworthy servants. We have done what was our duty to do. This verse is talking about the service that we render to the Lord. Some people could, maybe, maybe someone could say, I've helped convert 100 uh, souls to Christ in my 50 years as a Christian. Great work. Uh, many of us can say, I've been to church every Sunday, and I sing, and I, I give my offering, and uh, you know, listen to the sermon, and everything that, uh, they would say, the five acts of worship, push the five buttons, you know. We can do this. But in the end, it's not about what we do, because in the end, think about, even if we, we could help a thousand people come to Christ, would that save the world? No. There's no way whatever amount of service we can give to the Lord would ever equal that which the Lord Jesus Christ himself did by dying on the cross. So that takes away our bragging rights because now uh, it's, we can't brag about what we did. The Lord Jesus could brag about what he did, but you know what? The Lord is humble and he won't. Do we have bragging rights in the kingdom of God? We do not. Because as the prior verse says, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty to do. What we do have is the right to claim our rightful wages. What are the wages? Well, the wages of sin is death. That we have the right to claim and boast about if we want. We can't boast about the other things. If it weren't for Christ, we wouldn't have anything. So we are always dependent on the Lord. For the wages of sin is death, or the works of sin is death, and God condemns sin. What kind of works does the Bible approve of? Let's think about that now. In John chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Those are good works. The Lord, when did he start, when did uh, God the Father start planning all of this? The, the, uh, the creation of man, the fall of man, the restoration of man through Jesus Christ on the cross, and then the, the establishment of the church and his one day coming back for us. God's working. He has been working and he's still working. Jesus hasn't come back yet. One day he will. Maranatha is the word. The Lord comes. John 9, 4. I must work the works of him who has sent me while it is day, for the night is coming when no man can work. There's a, there's a hymn, remember? Work for the night is coming. That's, what this, that's where it came from, from this particular verse. John 6, 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. That is the, the kinds of works that God wants. Jesus works, God works. Uh, Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me. We, we also must work the works that God has, has shown us to do. And Jesus said, this is the work that you believe on. This is the primary. Because if you don't believe, nothing else that you ever do matters. So that's the primary. Let's keep going. There's two other words that are also defined as work in the Bible. One of them is energeos. That sound familiar? Means to, to work or to produce. Secondly, it means to effect the outcome. And thirdly, is to aid someone. And it makes sense because energeo sounds an awful lot like energy, right? And energy definitely affects the outcome. If you turn on the switch and there's no electricity, guess what? It's going to affect the outcome. So you got to have energy. And then here's one verse that uses that word. He says, For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. Here's the word, twice. 
worked effectively in Peter. What did he do for Peter? He energized him. That's what he did. He put a, a light after, uh, on him and said, get going. And Peter did it. Why did he do it? Because he had been with the Lord for one. That's a great blessing in itself. But after the Lord had died, he realized what the Lord was really telling him all along. And he got to work. This is one. Energeos, that's another word that's interpreted as work. Oops, I went too far. Come back. Come back. Here's the, a second word. Sunerje. Means to work together. You've heard that. A lot of you in work, I'm sure, have heard of synergy. Matter of fact, there's an electrical company out there called Synergy. What do they do? They take the, the uh, light from the sun with the solar panels on your house and they connect it to the electrical grid, anything that's left over. And they connect the two. That's Synergy. Literally with energy. But uh, it means to work together. There's two different words in this particular verse that show up. The first one is the synergy. Do you see that faith was working together, there's synergy, with his works, and it's talking about Abraham, and by works faith was made perfect. This is, this is James chapter 2, verse 22, but it's going back to uh, Genesis chapter 22. If we remember the story, in Genesis 22, God called Abraham, and I'm going to go ahead and read that. It's only six verses. And it says here, Now it goes about after these things, Genesis 22, 1, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah to offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. And Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to the young men that were with them, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Think about this later. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offerings and laid it on Isaac his son and took it in his hand with fire and the knife until the two of them walked together. I'm sorry, verse 8. That's how far we're going. Isaac told Abraham, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And God said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. We could continue reading. Let's go ahead and read out to verse 12. And they went to the place that God had told them, and Abraham built the altar there, arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him, from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. That's the story that, of course, James is talking about. When James said, do you see that faith was working together with his works And by works, faith was made perfect. Remember, when Abraham left the two uh, servant boys with the donkey, he said, wait here for for Isaac and I will go up on the mountain. And then what did he say? And we will return. That's his faith. He knew that God would find a way to bring Isaac back with him. He was going to offer him as a sacrifice. And he knew that even from the dead, God could bring back Isaac. If so, was the Lord's plan. And so he acted. His faith said, God said, go, I'm going. And by his works, 
and 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 he he worked his faith worked together with his with his works and because of his work what did god say now i know that you fear the lord so the two work together see that's an excellent example of this synergy of work let's keep going i love that story that's a great story unfortunately it's not just a story it really happened so what do we do with this, with all this information? John 6, 29 says, this is the work of God, that you believe on him who he has sent. That's the first thing we can do as far as works, is to believe on God, on God uh, that you believe on him who he sent, which is Jesus Christ. Mark 16, 16 says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, he that believes that not shall be condemned, shall be damned. Here's another thing we can do. We can obey the Lord. We can come to him in baptism and there be saved. Our faith will make us, will move us to be saved. And it's not the act that saves us. What's, what is it that saves us? It's the obedience to the command of the Lord. So if we obey this command, then we, like Abraham, prove with our work of our, our physical uh, example uh, or physical doing that, yes, we believe. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is another thing we can do. You know, most of the time when we looked at the Apostle John, uh, we believe that uh, he's the kindest of the apostles, and, and he, all he shares in his writings is love. John is one of the strictest apostles, if you read his writings correctly. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's pretty strong stuff, because guess what? If you don't keep his commandments, what are you saying, first of all? That you don't love him. And if you say you love him, but don't keep his commandments, uh, you're not fooling the Lord, let's just say that. John is one of the strictest writers in the gospel. Matthew 28, 18 through 19. Go ye therefore into all the world, baptize all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So here's another thing we can do. We can teach them to observe all things whatever the Lord has commanded us. And you know, there's nothing like teaching book, chapter, and verse. Uh, I remember a while back, I think it was, uh, anyway, a while back we were recommended to read uh, Muscle and Shovel, or Shovel and Muscle, I don't remember that, that book, the title. But you know, that's an excellent book. It goes back to the idea of this, teaching, and how to teach. Excellent book. I think that we need to uh, take advantage of those kinds of things that are out there, and, and uh use them. Of course, the best example of teaching the gospel was Jesus himself. We know that. Fifthly, James chapter 2 says in the end of that discussion of talking about Abraham, he says faith without works is dead. So that's what we need to do is have faith, but we need to have works. And I think Sean mentioned that last week where we talk about God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. And sometimes we get the truth part right, it's true, and we lose the spirit part, as far as being the, the motivated Christians that we need to be. And so faith without works is dead. Let's keep going. And you know, in the end, when you look at all this, the Apostle Paul, I believe, said it best. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 8 through 10, he says, Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Think about that. When did he, Paul persecute the church of God? In its infancy. When is the human being the most vulnerable. When it's a baby. You leave the baby, you, if you take a baby and lay it there and go away, that baby's going to die. 
It's the most vulnerable. It's when it needs the most attention. And that's when Paul came and did what he did against the church, dragging people to prison, condemning some to death. He was bad. He was really bad. But then he says in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly. Was he trying to earn his salvation? No. He labored more abundantly because he felt the pain of what he had done in his lifetime against the church and against the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why he labored. I, I looked up that word because it interested me that it said labored. It means to toil, to grow weary, grow tired, or to simply be exhausted. The other day I came home, uh, I was at work, and see, you know, and, and then I, I would cut the yard, and for whatever reason, by the time I got done, I was exhausted. Probably because I sit in my rear end all day long at work. And then actually came home and did some work. And you know, I was exhausted, but I'm sure I wasn't exhausted as the Apostle Paul was. So in conclusion, Remember this text. This is a great text. A great text. That the Apostle Paul, or that the, uh, the writer here, Luke, says in the end, he says, we are unprofitable servants. What we have done was our duty to do. When we have finally laid down our lives from this world, and they bury us in our final resting place. This is all we can say. We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty to do. There's nothing we could have do to equal what Christ did. But the work that we can do in the Lord can further his kingdom. And it will help us to have a place in heaven, not because of the work we did, but because the Lord sees like he did with Abraham. Now I know that you fear the Lord. And so that's why we do what we do for the Lord. Not because we're getting anything, because we want to show the Lord. We want to please the Lord with our action on this, on this earth. And even after all the things that we've done, we need to keep in balance these texts here. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the continuation of the verse says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If that isn't a great balancing act within itself, I don't know what is. But isn't that what the Lord has always said? If you do what I tell you to do, you will have these blessings. But if you don't, you will have these uh, curses and damnations against you. Titus 3.5 he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but on the basis of his mercy through the washing of the new birth and the renewing of the spirit. There's that call to obedience, and we did it. And we followed through with works of love for the Lord. We talk about a labor of love. These are, that's a labor of love when you do things for the Lord. Ask all the preachers on this face of this earth, you know, the preacher goes every day to preach, and sometimes he's the only one standing in the front of the building. You can't tell that from here. There's probably, what, 100 plus that come here every day on Sunday. There are preachers that go and preach. I remember uh, one preacher said, you know how I started? I'd go to the building and I'd preach. Sometimes it's just me and my wife. Sometimes my wife was sick and it was just me. But I'd be there and I'd be preaching. He says, people would show up and they'd look around like, who's he preaching to? But he was doing his work. And you know what? He filled that building. Because he was doing a labor of love. And he continued to do it. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of works so that no man can boast. And then verse 10 is a great verse. For we are his workmanship, having been created in Christ for good works, that God has prepared beforehand so that we may do them. 
What's God saying in this last verse? What he's saying is, God made us for the purpose, for the purpose of doing his good works. No one on, in this building for sure and on the face of the earth can say, I can't do God's work. You know what? We are his workmanship. He made us for this reason. And he will energize us. Remember that word? Energize. He will energize us and help us to do it. Give us the means. You ever try teaching someone and all of a sudden you, all these verses are coming out of your mouth and you say, where'd that come from? That's God energizing you because you have decided to take on the work that God created you to do. So remember, the greatest motivation we can have in all this, God's grace the works that, that he, uh, on one side, condemns because of the man's tendency to want to boast or think he, he earned it, but on the other hand, works that are for the Lord, and we do it because of love. Remember that God loves you. That's why we want to do these things. John 5, 17, Jesus answered and said, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working, and he's still working. God bless you all. The lesson is yours. We can. If anyone today has not obeyed the gospel, this is the time we'll, we'll do it as the opportunity to do so as we sing a, a hymn of invitation to you that we hope will encourage you to come to Christ. Remember, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. It's all yours.